since we are recording this, um, I'll make sure to post this, this technology tip on YouTube for everybody. If you're having trouble with a piece of electronics, uh, UWIT, let me know. Turn it off, turn it back on again, and sometimes it'll fix the problem. And believe it or not, you know, miracle solution here today. Okay. Happy Monday. Welcome back. Thank you guys for joining online. Um, we will have a little bit of a discussion today. Um, so get ready to, to um, you know, join in. I think that made the lecture on Friday really, really fun. I appreciate the people who, even if you're just joining in once a week to some of these online lectures in real time, I think it will uh, really help keep some of the cohesion overall. It'll also keep things on schedule. I know that's how kind of my brain works. If I know that nine o'clock on Monday, Wednesday, Friday is my time to study um, this type of information, it'll adhere a little bit better. I think the same type of um, mentality that I put into in-person classes will also hold true for these online ones. When I design my lectures for in-person, the purpose of coming to those lectures is I teach and I uh, test from the lectures themselves. If we don't cover it in lecture, it's not on the exam. With that thought process, if you come to the lectures and make time for those lectures, I understand some people can't, um, and you have all the content that's necessary, my thought process is that means less time studying. And if I know I have to study less just by attending and kind of watching some lectures and, you know, maybe ask them one or two questions, for me, that's preferable. For other people, I know that they would prefer to just watch a video and, you know, study and cram the night before the exam. That's on you. So um, that's the purpose of these lectures. So hopefully we can get a couple people participating. We're switching gears a little bit. Today, we're going to talk about the World Anti-Doping Association and ADAMS, which is part of their World Anti-Doping Association overall, and then kind of talk about some of the normal testing procedures. These are the nuts and bolts that I've talked about before that aren't the fun stuff. You know, we have some physiology majors in this class um, who are just chomping at the bit. Show me a gosh darn mechanism already. Um, and before we get there, we are going to talk about some of the boring nuts and bolts of what goes into testing. Because if we're going to understand what the people are looking for and what these drugs do, we have to first know what are the procedures that the World Anti-Doping Association has in place that are designed to help catch those people in general. When we watch the video on you know, uh, Icarus and we talk about some of the machinations that go into a person doping. Now we're going to say, okay, well, if we understand these, we can kind of see how they got around some of those rules. So we'll talk about that a little bit today. First, quick little review. And this is, I'm going to be posting these by, I think Wednesday is my goal uh, to post the review question assignments. So you, everybody is going to be assigned to make uh, one more question, just a quick video, just like you did for your intro, but we'll have two or three people per lecture. So then instead of me designing the review questions, it'll be your fellow classmates who are asking the questions that we review in the beginning of lecture. And what this is designed for is to just get everybody to be like, okay, I had a weekend, I studied all this stuff, went outside, went for a hike, where the heck were we on Friday? This is hopefully gonna bring you back into that mindset. So the three things that I took away from our lecture on um, Friday were, number one, how can you know if a supplement is safe? So with that, can I get somebody to chime in there and refresh my memory on that one? Let's go ahead and start at the bottom. If you guys don't, I, I like to call on people in class, so I will continue to call on people in class. Uh, Hannah, are you there? Would you mind uh, letting me know how you know if a supplement is safe? Um, if it's FDA approved. Ooh, this is the, what I like to call these, this is really important for class, if you have me in person or if you have me online. Hannah just answered with the 100% perfect wrong answer. <laughs> okay. So she said, we know if a supplement is safe, if it is FDA approved. The reason that that is the perfect wrong answer is because supplements are not regulated by the FDA. And we would think that with any other medication. How do I know if a medication is safe? Well, the FDA goes through stringent testing protocols to make sure it's right. With supplements, because they are classified as nutrition, 
even though food is regulated by that, they're outside of that kind of purview of the FDA. So there are three independent uh, kind of review committees. And what I'm going to say here is not the FDA. And if we briefly go back to our lecture from Friday, if you remember, these are the three organizations right here, these guys. So what they do is they look to see if it's properly manufactured, if it has the right ingredients, if it contains the harmful contaminants, but not necessarily, is it going to work? Okay. So thank you, Gretchen. Appreciate that. Any questions on that? Okay, let's move on. What does ADME stand for? And we will continue to go through the list here. Let's see. Nathan, are you there? Nathan's grabbing a new cup of coffee. Anya, would you be able to let us know what ADME stands for? That one I actually do not remember. Okay, great. And this is why we do the reviews. ADME, A is absorption. D is distribution. M is metabolism. And E is excretion. So what this does is it basically tells us how the drug gets into throughout, broken down, and out of our body. It's the life cycle of any drug that we're taking in, okay? You know, um, it goes anywhere from, you know, drinking your cup of coffee to then a little while later, knowing that you drank too much coffee because you went to the bathroom and you're like, oh, it smells like a coffee filter in here. Okay, last one. A drug can function in three ways as an antagonist, okay? So this is a drug blocking an action. You don't want something to happen. There are three ways that this ha can happen. If we're looking for an agonist, the only way an agonist drug works is it's going to bind to the same receptor. Okay, that's what we went over on Friday. But if it's an antagonist, we have three different ways. One, two, three. Okay, Hunter, can you chime in here and let us know the three ways an antagonist could work, or at least just one of those ways? Uh, so one of those ways is, I can't remember exact names or anything. There are none, so just shoot it. All righty. So one of them is it can bind to the actual molecule and changing its shape so that it can't bind to the uh, receptor. Okay, bind to the normal mess messenger molecule and can deactivate that or change the shape of it. And you talked about something in there, the receptor. So we can bind and block the receptor. And last one here, there's one more way. Let's see, Victoria, would you be able to talk about the third way possibly an antagonist would work? Uh, he remembered the two that I was going to say, so he took the words right out of my mouth. All right, no problem. The third way, if we're thinking about insulin, for example, that's what we use on Friday, we could just stop the release of insulin, stop the release of the messenger molecule in the first place. Okay, so the example I like to give here is, you know, we all learn back in our, in our history classes. I'm from New England originally, so, you know, got a strong memory for American history. We think of Paul Revere, right? Paul Revere, what happened when, you know, the, the British were coming, he was alerted and he got on his horse with his lantern and started riding down, you know, to let everybody know, hey, the British are coming, the British are coming. The three ways that a antagonist can work is, okay, if we want to block the receptor, what that is, is you just blew out his lantern, okay? And, and you stopped his voice from working, 
That's what that is. What if you want to bind to the normal messenger molecule? Now you can't distribute that the same way you're, you're bringing. That's, you know, you uh, take his horse and you move his horse. Well, now he gets alerted. Here he is. He's out. He's ready to go. He's got his lantern ready to yell, but he can't go anywhere. And the last one is you stop the release of the messenger molecule in the first place. That's you close the door to his original house. He can't even get out. Okay. So those are the three types of ways an antagonist can work. All right, let's move on to our new stuff. We are talking about WADA today. So I'm going to try and stream some videos. Um, as I do this, can I just get a thumbs up from you guys that you can hear the volume? Not that one. It was on YouTube. Here we go. Uh-oh. Screen sharing is stopped as the share window is closed. I got an idea here. It appears that opening up YouTube stopped my screen sharing app from working. So what I will do, I'll get rid of that. Try to log back into this. Sorry, guys. Hang with me here. Mirror is back up and running, but to share my video, what I'll do is just something a little bit different here. Can you guys, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see the YouTube screen here? Okay. Can you hear volume? No volume. Hang on. Sport also brings out the worst in some of us. Athletes who use performance-enhancing drugs cheat everyone. Their families and fans, fellow athletes, but most of all, themselves. After all, sport is really all about equality. We are WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency headquartered in Montreal, Canada. We're the result of a unique partnership between sport and governments worldwide with a mission to help athletes play true. That's why the World Anti-Doping Code was created. To protect athletes, to protect sport, and to protect greater public health. 
Accepted by nearly 600 international organizations and all Olympic sports, it's the foundation for anti-doping efforts everywhere. In effect, the core framework for harmonized anti-doping policies, rules and regulations in all countries, in all sports. We promote honesty, integrity and equality in sport through education and outreach, teaching the real value of playing clean, as well as the many dangers and consequences of doping. We facilitate and monitor the work of sport, government, and many others who analyze and investigate. In fact, our research program is the only international program dedicated to the development of methods to detect doping abuse. After all, our fight is everyone's fight. Every athlete, every parent, every coach, trainer, and doctor, every government, sports federation, and lab, every Olympic committee, even every fan. We're proud to be leading the fight because our responsibility is to the smallest child all the way up to the Olympic medalist. We know we can't change things overnight, but we do know things have to change. And we know we're already making a difference. That's why we do what we do, so everyone can play true. Okay, can you guys still hear me? stop this share. I'm going to go back to a different share. Cool. All right, so you guys can see my screen now again, right? Thanks for hanging with me as we're kind of figuring out this technology. Okay, so the question now is, what is WADA in general? Okay, that's a pretty, you know, kind of brief intro video that we have there about what WADA is. So I just want to review kind of some of the initial stuff that's involved with, okay, who is WADA overall? Let's do this one. Here we go. First, it stands for the World Anti-Doping Association. And they kind of have three different committees overall. One is focused on the athletes. And we're going to talk about more about them in a minute. The second is to focus on education. And the third is focused on finance. And the reason that that finance is, you know, that tends to kind of stick out a little bit as I'm thinking about this. But the reason that that's so important is because they need a lot of money to do the testing. Anybody who's worked in a wet lab before, which is what they're doing, can attest to the fact that a lot of the stuff in there costs a lot of money. I mean, you're doing everything from buying pipette tips to different microplates and everything along the line. You're spending a lot of money doing this, especially if you're doing cutting edge type of, you know, identification of new analysts. So we know that that costs a lot of money and we have to make sure that we're doing that. Um, for example, if we wanted to kind of put this into perspective, though, as far as how much money they're spending versus how much money they're making, the first thing I want to do, let's go back. We're going to go way back to 2017. This was the kind of the, uh, the figures that I was able to pull up for today. We'll talk about highest grossing athletes. And this will kind of really uh, date myself because back then the highest grossing athlete was Floyd Mayweather. This was back when he was still boxing. Um, and I think this was the year that he actually fought Conor McGregor, um, who if you like uh, mixed martial arts at all, the two of them had a, a fight, uh, a boxing match. So he was the second leading grossing athlete and this is just in sport this is not having to do with um any sort of endorsement deals because we all know you know lebron james made way more money on all of his investments overall um but if we just think about what their paycheck was from their sport in one year
Anybody want to take a guess of what one of these athletes made? $50 million for Floyd. Garrett, what do you think? $50 million for Floyd Mayweather. Oop. Can I hear you again? Uh, $50 million. $50 Floyd. Million. Floyd made $100 million. And Conor McGregor made $65 million. Not too bad. Not too bad of a payday for one year's worth of work, and I think they may have had two fights total for that whole year. Pretty darn good. Now, let's talk about what the WADA budget was. What do we think? Just by a show of hands on people on video, just give me either an up arrow or a down arrow to think where – is it more or less than one athlete? Seeing a lot of down arrows here and, and some confused looks. You are right. The entire World Anti-Doping Association budget for the world was $30 million. So this gets back to what we talked about during the first week of classes here. We have individual athletes who are making three times the annual budget of the entire anti-doping association in general. Now, who is going to be have more incentive or more resources to dope? The athletes or WADA to stop it? From this, you can easily see that the amount, the, the scales, if we were to tip them for either pro-doping or anti-doping, are way in the side of pro-doping. Because if you take, I mean, even if you took the top 100 athletes, the amount of money there to continue being good at their sport, so they continue getting paid millions and millions of dollars a year, you take somebody like Floyd Mayweather, he could very easily, you know, take $30 million and invest that money into a, a new drug that would not be detected. Okay. I'm not saying he did that, but it's very easy to see how the math lines up way on the side of pro doping. Okay. Let's move on to our next one. We're going to talk about Adams. So Adams is the observation protocol that WADA has in place that all of the athletes have to check in for. So Hannah, I'm going to pick on you again, because I know you're a student athlete here. Do you have to work with the university at all to kind of um, check in for any drug tests or anything like that? Um, yeah, so we haven't had any as of yet, but usually we'll get told by our trainers um, on the Monday, the, tr the um, testing usually happens on the Tuesday and they'll tell us you're about to get drug tested. And then they do a university one and then they do one through the NCAA um, and yeah, we have to check in with that and then it's, it's random. It just, they randomly select you. And then I've had it a couple of times. Everyone pretty much has it at least twice usually. Throughout your career. Yeah. Man, I was, I was a student athlete for four years. Believe it or not, they were not testing the men's crew team at George Washington university very much, especially the guy who sat in the back of the boat and steered. That's why I uh, anyways, they weren't worried about me, you know, doping or, you know, my huge bench press affecting the outcome of any of the games. Uh, anyways, let's go on. We're going to watch another video here. So I will stop to share this one. We're going to watch a video on what Adams is, um, and how that works. So let's do this. Stop the share. We'll go to different share. Yes, this is the video I want. Can you, you guys can see that video there? The information contained in this little bottle helps keep sport on a level playing field. That's why collecting, storing, entering, and sharing this anti-doping information with the people who need it should be as easy and secure as filling this bottle. That's why we created Adams, the free anti-doping administration and management system from WADA. The most technological...
technologically advanced, reliable, and convenient web-based system used by over 130 anti-doping organizations and laboratories, plus 20,000 athletes. Adams easily and safely records an athlete's therapeutic use exemption, whereabouts, and test results, all operating under a level of security typically used by financial institutions. Okay, so people who watch the Icarus movie, this is that cat that they were talking about in the movie. You can see the little teeth on there that are hopefully going to make it pretty secure, so it can't be open unless you break the cap. Um, but obviously, the people who in uh, Russia who were able to do this, maybe they watched this video a couple times and got the schematics here and were able to figure it out. Who knows? But anyway, they were able to figure out how to get these caps off without breaking them. I've also never seen a urine container with sunglasses on before. In effect, becoming the centralized command house for all anti-doping information. Sports is uh, a symbol of purity. I think personally that sports should be clean for everyone. And I've never tried myself and I never will because everybody should have the same chance to win and be a true champion. For us, the athletes, the objective is to fill out less papers as possible. Everyone who's up with Adams, we only have one. Complying with the rules shouldn't be demanding. It shouldn't be hard. It's accessible online. It alleviates unnecessary administration. And probably the most important factor for us as an international federation, it's free. Every time you fax a paper, you never know exactly who's going to get it and where it's going to go. With Adams, you feel safe. You know that your information are secure and you know that only the right people will have access to them. It's all about clean sport. I have nothing to hide. No one should have anything to hide. So Adams is a great platform for us to really make it available and get rid of the doping in the sports. It's been uh, helpful in terms of the resources that we've been able to allocate to the testing as opposed to uh, concentrate uh, more or less everything on administration. And now with Adams, uh, everything is centralized. And if I have just a minor correction to do, I don't have to uh, fill up the whole form once again. I trust Adams. Adams is there to support us all. Adams helps me show the world I have nothing to hide. Adams will protect the clean athlete and as a result can help bring an entire nation to its feet. It's no surprise why athletes and sports organizations throughout the world think of Adams as the ultimate tool to help level the playing field. Adams, after all, everyone should play true. Wow, some striking stuff there from the World Anti-Doping Association. We'll stop this show and go back to our notes here. Okay, so let's move on to talk about what Adams did in general. So it's the Anti-Doping Administration Management System. Anti. Doping. Administration. And management system. And we have four main roles within that. So obviously, Adams does the, you know, the grunt work of collecting the results in general. They are not necessarily the ones doing the testing. That's a third party, but once those tests uh, are run, they will collect the results. They will store those results. They will enter those. And they will share the results. And the purpose of this in general is to take some of the uh, potential for malfeasance off of the people who are doing the testing in the first place. Because what happens is people who do the testing basically send blind results to Adams, and they are the ones who interpret those results and will be able to tell the rest of the governing bodies for uh, different organizations if somebody has tested. Can you think of a way that it would be easy if the person 
um, who would tell if a, a drug test was positive or negative was the same as the person who was giving that test in the first place. So I'm the drug tester. I'm also the lab person who's going to go back and test that sample. I'm also the person who has to call the rest of the governing bodies to say, yep, uh, you know, uh, Laney tested positive today, so, you know, she's out of competition. But it may be very, very easy then for me to go in and I'm about to administer the test. And, you know, Laney says to me, here's a 20. This is going to be negative, right? With this type of administration, this umbrella over everything, it discounts the ability for that type of thing. So that's one of the reasons they don't have access in the first place. And they store some information they didn't necessarily talk about in the video overall. The first one is the therapeutic use exemptions. Maddie, would you be able to give us an example of something that you think would have a therapeutic use exemption? Uh, like medical marijuana. Ooh, that's a really, really hard one. And I'm sure that's under review right now because the evidence of the benefits and the things that doctors are actually prescribing medical marijuana for is increasing. If you look back three or four years, you probably would not be able to get a therapeutic use exemption. But for example, my grandmother, who's 95 years old, it, you know, I had neck pain. She went to the doctor, and that's what the doctor prescribed her. So could you potentially get a therapeutic use exemption for medical marijuana? Absolutely. Probably not in Wyoming, but in a lot of other states. Okay, so that's a great example. The classic example that we think about, and if we, uh, you know, kind of sport wide, and we'll get to this when you guys look in your uh, textbook for the next section, inhalers. Inhalers are number one for therapeutic use exemptions because especially with pollution in some of the large cities increasing, more and more people are necessarily needing inhalers and they can be life-saving for a person who has asthma. Are they abused in sport? Absolutely. And, you know, Hannah, have you seen these in swimming? Yeah. Especially yeah. since we train indoors, Often the chlorine, a lot of people get chlorine cough and they battle to breathe, so it's very common. Yeah, and there's a lot of research out there to say, you know, is there a vapor layer at the, you know, kind of high, just above, in those six inches above the top of the pool that has a higher concentration of kind of vaporized uh, chlorine in it, and does that affect your breathing? And some of the evidence out there says that, yeah, uh, an inhaler could help a person like this. So it's not the typical causes that would require an, uh, an inhaler to be prescribed in general, but there's definitely some benefits. Now, when we learn about beta-2 agonists, we will talk about the potential uh, performance enhancements that are involved in those. And then also, there are some inhalers that are prescribed for asthma that also have steroids in them. Ugh. So then we get into this uh, kind of tricky situation where is this being therapeutically uh, prescribed to deal with a medical condition or is this going to be something that's going to help the individual out? So we'll get there. But the first thing is Adam stores all these results. Two, we already talked about this. They store the test results. And three, the last thing is whereabouts. of the athletes. And this is a nice thing that kind of brings us into our, our next uh, section where we talk about the doping control process, but all athletes have to let Adams know throughout the entire year, if they are a professional athlete, where they are, because they are uh, available, they have to be available for testing 365 of the days of the year, 24 hours a day. They don't get one day of notice like uh, student athletes will get. They get maybe hours of notice. And if they told somebody, hey, I'm going to be, you know, training in the Pyrenees, uh, so that's where I'm going to be for the next six weeks, and it turns out that later on they were somewhere else, they were down in South America um, at, a, at a doctor's office down there, well, they could get in trouble and have a failed drug test, not because they actually failed the drug test, but because they told Adams they were going to be one place and they were somewhere else. 
Okay. So that's something that's interesting about knowing their whereabouts. Overall, what are the benefits of this? It's one place for many purposes. This is like, you know, if anybody's ever gone to the doctor's office and they're like, okay, fill out these forms and then, you know, come back up to the window and you're like, okay. And then you fill out the forms and it's like, you, you put your name, your address, your social security on like three of the four pages that you just filled out. You're like, I just put this on the first page. Like, why can't you just look at the first page and then put this over here? That's what Adams is. You fill out one thing in one spot and because it's one larger institution, there's crosstalk between the people who are collecting the results and the people who are sharing the results. The athletes can just contact them for one thing and then they know that all four of those different things are going to be taking place. Okay. So they don't have to fill out paperwork for, you know, giving the test and contact a different agency to let them know where they're going to be. It's one place for a lot of things. And also because of that, it lowers administration costs. We already talked about how they have a pretty low budget. It's free for the athletes. Even though we have athletes like, you know, uh, Floyd Mayweather making $100 million a year, you talk to any other professional athlete who plays for Team USA, and I guarantee they are not driving around a Lamborghini. For the most part, they're probably, you know, living with roommates, scrapping things together to make ends meet so that they can just be an athlete for the United States. You know, yeah, they might get a free meal here and there, you know, at, at one of the dining halls, but they're not living large. So it's important that it's free and also that it's secure. It's a third party. We don't have to worry about that too much. Okay. So we're going to go on to the doping control process. I'm going to watch it. We're going to watch a video, but this is something I like to do normally in class, but obviously we are not in class. So um, this is an optional assignment that you can do. We have plenty of required assignments for this class that are, you know, some of the videos, some of the quizzes, those sorts of things. This one's an optional one. Uh, the doping control process, major competition. You can answer these questions and submit a drawing for the chance to win a mug. One of my favorite things to do here in Laramie is go over to the, um, uh, Salvation Army, or what is it, the Goodwill store. And if you go to their back wall there, they generally have a collection of some of the finest mugs in Wyoming proper. I found this one right here. On this mug, it says, you got this. And I believe this, guys. Everybody here, really, I mean, COVID is, it stinks. But this mug, every morning, if you win this, will let you know, you know what? You know what, Ross? You got this. So, if you complete this assignment right here, quick little thing. We're going to watch a video right now. You can do it after that. Answer these questions. Why do we test? What is a DCO? List and describe the five parts of testing. And then here's where, you know, we separate, you know, the haves from the have nots. Draw your best picture of the doping control process. After these are submitted by Wednesday at the latest, okay, just email them to me. Take a picture on your phone. Just email it to me. Um, I will I will provide a 100% uh, objective review of all of the assignments. Once I select the winner, I will announce that winner on Wednesday during lecture. I will, you know, hopefully share my screen with the winning uh, submission. And then I will ask for that person's address. And this will be on its way to your house. We can do this socially distant. I will make sure to wipe it down before I put it in the container, which is now to you. So everybody... That's a, an optional assignment to help you kind of understand what the doping control process is because we're going to watch just a quick video right now that overviews that. And this is the video uh, that you will use to uh, help with the assignment. Okay, we'll stop sharing this one. And we will go to new share. Back to... Let's see, where is my actual... Oh, I close it. There we go. That's what I want. Doping control 
is an essential part of anti-doping programs to promote and protect the integrity of sport and the health of athletes. Testing is carried out in accordance with the World Anti-Doping Code and a series of international standards. I'm a doping control officer, also known as a DCO. I play a major role in protecting your rights in the doping control process, which consists of five phases. Athlete selection. Athlete notification. Sample collection. Sample analysis. And results management. So just to pause briefly right here you can see that Adams is integrated within this larger kind of doping control system. How can you be selected for testing? Testing can be conducted in two situations, in competition and out of competition. In competition testing, the selection may occur in a number of ways, including by random selection, based on finishing position, or by being targeted for a particular reason. For out of competition testing, you may be tested anytime, anywhere, with no advance notice. When identified in a registered testing pool, you will be required to provide whereabouts information. You may be tested at your home, your training location, or other relevant locations. How will you be notified? The notification process is the same for both in and out of competition testing. If you are selected for testing, I will show you my DCO accreditation to demonstrate that I am authorized to conduct testing. I will also explain your rights and responsibilities in the doping control process and ask you to sign a form. Once you have been notified, you must report immediately to the doping control station. You may request a delay for a valid reason, such as you are taking part in a medal ceremony, you must attend a press conference, you require medical treatment. Upon notification, a DCO or chaperone will stay at your side at all times until the testing process has been completed. What is the sample collection process? During this process, you also have specific rights, such as having a representative with you, as well as certain responsibilities. You must ask for a valid photo ID to confirm your identity. You will be asked to provide one or more urine samples and or blood samples. When you are ready to provide a urine sample, a doping control official of the This one always gets me because I'm like, Here's a person who went to, you know, uh, paper cutting school for animation, and they get the script, and they're like, wait, you want me to do a paper cutout of somebody peeing? All right, let's do this. Sure. Here's my account number. Same gender as you will witness the passing of the sample and will stay with you until you provide a sample that meets all requirements. You will then be asked to divide the urine sample into B and A bottles and then seal them. Throughout the process, you will be the only one to handle the sample collection equipment, unless you require assistance. Let's, let's take a break right there um, to just kind of emphasize the importance of that one point. They said you will be the only person to handle your sample during the sample collection. So from the time you get that sample jar to the time you put the top on, you're the only person who's touched that. Can somebody, you know, kind of take a guess of why that is so important? Um, I was just going to say because other athletes who are your competition or something could get someone to tamper with your results or like an organization that has something against you could tamper with your results. Yep. That's part of it right there. You know, if, if that left your hand, you know, I fill out my container and I hand it to somebody else with the top off and then I'm like, okay, fulfill my responsibility. I'm out of here. I got to, you know, go cool down or do whatever. Um, it's, it would be very easy for them to say, okay, hey, Dr. J, you tested positive for all these performance enhancing drugs. And I say, you know what? That wasn't me. I gave that thing to the doping control officer. The top wasn't off. Okay. There was a great case a couple of years ago with anybody following uh, Major League Baseball, uh, Ryan Braun. He's a baseball player who's tested positive for performance enhancing drugs like a number of times. Anyways, the first time he tested positive, 
did his test, they put his sample in the fridge, okay, overnight. And then the next day, the doping control officer came back. He had to go into his hotel and everything like that, came back, got the sample, sent it in, and test positive. Well, Ryan Braun filed a complaint against that and filed suit and said, you know what? That sample was by itself in that fridge overnight. Nobody was here. There's no cameras in the room with the fridge. Anything could have happened. Anything could have happened, including a person going in there and spiking my sample. And believe it or not, the review board that looked upon that said, you know what? He's right. Something could have happened. We lost the chain of custody. Something that we think about for evidence for law enforcement. Same thing. If there's no chain of custody, if they lose that chain of custody, you throw out the case and his uh, suspension in that case was overturned. You know, he tested positive multiple times after that, but in that one chance, he got it back. Finally, you will be asked to review and sign the doping control form. Sample and a copy of the form that does not disclose your identity will be sent to a WADA accredited laboratory, while the other copies will go to the relevant anti-doping organizations. The form will also be provided to you. How are the samples analyzed? Once your A sample arrives at the laboratory, it will be opened and analyzed. The B sample will be securely stored. Should the A sample reveal an adverse analytical finding, the B sample will be analyzed to confirm the result. How are the results managed? The lab will report the results to the anti-doping organization responsible for results management. A copy will be sent to WADA to ensure the accountability of the process. In the event of an adverse analytical finding, your rights include requesting and attending the B sample analysis within set deadlines, a fair hearing, and the right to an appeal. As an essential deterrent, a standard doping control process across all countries helps protect the right of athletes to compete on a level playing field in the true spirit of sport. Okay, so we kind of get to see a little bit of insight into what the uh, anti-doping process looks like. There's a great video that uh, my colleague, when I was at the University of Arkansas, that was actually a guy, we had sports management within our school of kinesiology when I was a postdoc there. Um, and so he had been a participant and one of the doping control officers, or he'd been involved in like the administration of one of the um, uh, Olympics. And he always shared this video. Uh, anybody heard of Missy Franklin before? She was a, a really, really good swimmer back at the Olympics. Um, and there's this great video. I, I wasn't able to pull it up in time for today's lecture, but you see her swimming, finishing, finishing first in a thing. And she's like, oh my gosh, yeah, I just won gold medal. This is it. So excited. She hops out of the pool and like takes three steps. And this person comes up and takes a badge and shows it to her. You know, she has just want to go up and there. Here's a person. Okay. You're going to get tested right now. Obviously she tested, you know, negative, all those sorts of things, but just to give you an insight into what that looks at the professional level, you just want to gold medal. And they are there 30 seconds after that, ready to test you. So there is some pretty tight oversight in general. Okay. I'm going to post links to these three videos. Um, so you can, if you wanted to do that optional assignment, go ahead and do that. Um, we will pick up on Wednesday with moving on to kind of some of the general items that are on the doping control list. Uh, and we will go from there. So any questions before we finish today? All right, guys. Well, thank you for joining. Stay tuned. By Wednesday, you will also get your assignments of when you have to submit your video questions. With that, you'll just wanna stay tuned because you only have about a 24 hour window to submit those from when the lecture goes up so that I can incorporate any of those video questions in the next lecture. All right, thanks for coming today and we will see you on Wednesday.